And today we're starting a six-week sermon series. We'll be in the um, first John uh, for the next six weeks, about a chapter a week. Uh, Pastor Leon and I will be sharing it, and it's called Speak Now. And it is exactly what um, Carissa was talking about. It's about the call we have in our life to share and witness to um, our risen Lord. So with that, I would love to open us in a prayer and uh, see what the Word has to say to us today. Will you please join me? Startle us, O God. Startle us anew with your truth. And by the power of your living spirit, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to these words, your holy word, that we might draw closer to Christ, empowered to go forth as his faithful disciples in the world. Amen. So I want to begin today uh, by telling a story about Jesus. Now, you probably expected as much, but what you may not be expecting is that this story isn't about Jesus Christ, but about Jesus Garcia Corona. And Jesus was a 26-year-old Mexican railroad brake man who lived way back in the early 1900s, who worked on the train line that ran between Nacazari, Sonora in Mexico and Douglas, Arizona in the U.S., And one day when the train was stopped in Nakazari, Jesus noticed that the hay on top of one of the railroad cars had caught fire. Well, then he also noticed that there were sparks flying out of the smokestack, which indicated that the firebox in the engine might be on fire. And then to make matters worse, the train cars were filled with dynamite and the winds were picking up. Well, when Jesus realized the danger at hand, he drove the train downhill. Now, I would say full steam ahead, except he was driving backwards for almost four miles until the dynamite exploded. And on that fateful November day, Jesus lost his life, but he rescued the entire population of Nakazari in the process. And guess what? We are able to hear about his selfless act today and all the loved ones he saved because they shared the story afterwards. In honor of what Jesus did for them, uh, the town of Nakazari changed its name to Nakazari de Garcia, and they put a statue of him up in the middle of the city. Um, A sports stadium now bears his name, as do many streets throughout Mexico. Songs have been written about him, a national holiday, the Railroad Workers' Day has been instituted, and he's declared a hero of humanity by the American Red Cross. And I think this story illustrates well the fact that when you've been rescued, you want to tell people about it. You want others to know about the one who saved you, about what they saved you from, about the act of love they offered, about the selflessness they showed and the sacrifice they made all for you. You want others to know that because of the rescuer's saving act, you've been given something amazing, another chance, a reason to rejoice, eyes open wide to the meaning of new life. And this is what the first followers of Christ experienced, especially in that aftermath of Easter. They were so influenced by the resurrection event, so transformed by encountering the risen one face to face, so certain that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God and the long-awaited Messiah, so convinced that they really were in the presence of God in flesh that they committed their lives to sharing the good news and the deep joy that it offers with others. So in the 40 days interacting with the risen Lord before he ascended again into heaven, the disciples realized that the story of God with us doesn't end with Jesus. The story of God with us continues on in the lives of those who believe in him. And to empower believers to live out the story, God gave and continues to give the Holy Spirit as a helper. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, on that day of Pentecost, the first Christian community was born. And we have a Gentile writer who documented the beginning of that first community of believers. So I want to read to you what he recorded, which can be found in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, Michael, if you'll put it on the screen, you can read along. But uh, here's what he said. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals and to their prayers, and a sense of awe came over everyone. 
God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles, and all the believers were united, and they shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. And every day they met together in the temple, and they ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. And so it began. What they knew here in their head, as we talked about last night, and with what they knew here now in their heart that was so profoundly deep and powerful, the first Christian community was established. And as soon, in an effort to share Christ's message with everyone possible, they divided and they went all different directions, north, south, east, and west. And they were so passionate about and so committed to reaching others that they were even willing to die for it. And as we know, many of them did. But my question is this, now what? Now in 2018, for those of us who weren't firsthand eyewitnesses to that empty tomb, how are we supposed to respond to this message? Well, I think our scripture reading today gives us some helpful advice. By the time of this writing, which was around 100 AD, only a generation or two after all of these face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus had taken place, the thrill and the wonder had already waned. So what began with intensity and excitement and this purpose of life for those original eyewitnesses had now become this diminished half-heartedness, kind of just rote habits, and they were significantly less passionate before. And over the course of time, many church members grew tired of making an effort to live up to all the ethical demands required of them. And then, among them, there were some Jewish Christians who had converted, and they were struggling with how long it was uh, taking for the Messiah to come again. I mean, they were left with very little hope after the Romans conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD and devastated the city and decimated the Holy Temple and then dispersed the Jews all throughout the kingdom and what is known as the diaspora. After all of this, they were having a hard time believing that Jesus was really going to return and save them. So at the time that all of the Jewish Christians are struggling with that, others in the Christian community were um, striving to help Christianity come to terms with um, the secular philosophy around them and, and some of the contemporary thought. They wanted to make Christianity a little more intellectually respectable. And what they were wrestling with was a way of thinking called Gnosticism that was really popular throughout the Greek world at the time. And the Gnostics taught that only the spirit was good, that matter or the material world was inherently evil. And because they believed this, Gnostics looked upon the world and our human bodies as essentially evil since they're made up of matter. And because they viewed the body negatively, it was neither a priority nor necessary for them to refrain from indulging its appetites. For Gnostics, the only good found within the body was the human spirit and what they called the tiny seed of God that was imprisoned within. And their whole life purpose was to free this tiny seed in a liberation process known as secret knowledge. So... Here are a few other areas of conflict, and I'm bringing these up. Hang with me here, because the whole first chapter of John, John is attacking these back. He's making his rebuttal. So here, here are three in particular that we're going to meet in the first chapter. So Gnostics were on a quest to obtain full knowledge, which they believe meant participating fully in all life experiences, both good and bad. They wanted to gain an understanding of the depths of human experience and the heights. And so that meant engaging in everything. Anything was allowed. The Gnostics also believed that they could reach spiritual perfection on their own, that they could shed the evil material things and reach that height of spiritual perfection, which meant they didn't need to be saved from any sin. And finally, a central focus of Gnosticism was acquiring this special knowledge, which required lots of time of study and, and practice of the disciplines, and only certain classes of people could do that. Most of the working class people, or the common people, didn't have the opportunity because they were too busy with the ins and outs of everyday life to manage time for that. So as a result, an us and them scenario was introduced regarding spirituality. And these divisions broke down the fellowship and compromised the unity of the community and process. So these are the three Gnostic beliefs that John's going to push against today. One, 
that incarnation is impossible. They said, Gnostics say there's no way that the divine can take on human flesh because human flesh is evil. Two, that we have no sin for Christ to forgive. And three, that the fullness of knowledge and life experience possible, we need to walk in the light and we need to bask in the darkness. So over the next few weeks, when John addresses the Christian community about these divisions, he's going to speak directly to these critical misunderstandings and confront the issues at hand. His rebuttals are going to play out throughout the letter, and um, here are what he fights against today. He's going to say, nope, incarnation, God in flesh is possible. We have seen it, we have heard it, we have touched it, and you know what? The encounter was absolutely life-changing. And because God is righteous and holy and enfleshed in the body of Jesus Christ, matter is not inherently evil. And then John's going to say, sin is real. Sin is a reality, and it is something that we cannot overcome on our own. And in verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We often hear that at a call to confession. Uh, in our traditional services. And then finally, John is going to address the need to experience both the good and bad of life fully and that dichotomy of light and darkness by insisting that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. John's challenging his audience to address the presence of false teachers and their false teachings because that misinformation is causing a division in the community and he's trying to bring them back together in fellowship with God and Christ at the center of it all. So now let's listen for John's word to them and God's word to us from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the word of life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also might have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So John's letting us know that when our eyes, ears, hearts, and hands have been opened wide by the risen one, we open wide our mouths and lives to bear witness. And we bear witness so that others may have fellowship with both the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and with us. And when we're all united together in communion, our joy will be complete. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and talk about this little word, fellowship. Fellowship is a churchy word. I mean, you really only hear it in church circles. Think about it. We have fellowship groups. You're invited to the fellowship luncheon. And guess what? It's going to be held in the fellowship hall. And we're going to have a time of fellowship while we're there. But really, other than when you're here at church, when do you use the word? I mean, do you ever call it fellowship when you and a bunch of friends from work get together for a social event? Like, do you call that fellowship? But, that's happy hour. That's right. But unfortunately, I think that perhaps we've used the word so loosely over the years that we no longer grasp its full meaning. We now seem to use it for a general description of any time Christians are getting together. But really, it is much, much more than that. The original word used in Greek was koinonia, meaning holding something in common, a mutual interest that creates a closeness and intimacy among all of those involved. And where there's koinonia, there is communion. And it involves active participation. And it involves generosity. And it involves sharing communion. That's koinonia. And that's what John's referring to. This interactive relationship between God and believers who share something in common and that something that they share 
is Jesus Christ and the good news of that ability to live into that resurrection life. So one of my favorite koinonia moments happened about 25 years ago. I was doing mission service in the United Kingdom. I was in my late 20s, living in London, serving on staff of a Christian organization there called Time for God. And when I first arrived, I was given room and board in a residential center for international students called Chester House um, until I could find a flat to rent. Now, the Time for God office was located in the basement of Chester House, so even though I was not very excited to be almost 30 years old and living in a dorm room again, I really couldn't complain about my commute to work. <laughs> it's only about two minutes walk downstairs. So meals were provided in the Chester House cafeteria, and one night after getting my dinner tray with my little rectangle of shepherd's pie and my little square of mushy peas, I found an open seat next to a young woman who had just moved to London from Minsk. Her name was Julia Mimvoliva. And of the 150 residents living in Chester House, Julia was the only one from Belarus, and I was the only American, or Yank, as they like to call me. And the two of us soon found ourselves sitting together frequently. Julia was just learning English at a nearby college, and when we first met and the fall semester was kicking off, um, her English abilities were a bit limited. So we just covered the basics, like our names, where we grew up, a little about our families, whether we had a boyfriend or not, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but really, then, the rest of the time was spent with shrugs and hand motions and smiles, because we really didn't understand what the other one was saying. Uh, but we hung in there. And I am so glad we did because Julia was a quick study with the language and soon we were able to talk and discuss things um, because her language came on at an oppressive rate. So we continued to eat, a friendship formed, and then Christmas break arrived. And neither of us had plans to go back to our home countries, but I had scheduled a trip up to Edinburgh, Scotland to spend Christmas, um, that week between Christmas and New Year's, with a group of American volunteers who were working in churches and nonprofits in the Edinburgh area, and they lived in a Christian community. They all lived in a house together. And so I invited Julia to come to Christmas with us. And when Christmas Eve arrived, the group decided to attend one of the Christmas Eve worship services at St. Giles Cathedral. And for those of you who know Edinburgh, that's the historic city church of Edinburgh. It is the mother church of Presbyterianism. And we had a pew full. And we worshiped beneath beautiful stained glass windows and a sanctuary filled with sacred music and our favorite Christmas hymns. And then after the service, we um, exited that majestic building in silence and the fame crown spire was above us and we were walking the royal mile edinburgh castle illuminated before us and it was the quiet of the night just enveloped us the air was cold and crisp and every time we exhaled we could see our breath rising and the only sound was our boot heels clicking on the cobblestone It was kind of echoing off the stone walls along the way. At least this is how I have captured this memory in my uh, head. It was was like a hallmark moment, y'all. So then a question pierced the silence of the night. A question from Julia, asking us to tell her more about this Christmas story she just heard for the very first time. She did not know it had never heard anything about it, and definitely wanted to learn more. Who was that baby in the manger, and why did he mean so much to all of us? And so we shared the story, the most amazing story there is, right? Love so great that our sovereign creator became one of us to rescue all of us. So we shared the story along with how it changed our lives, how it challenges who we are today, how it influences who we want to be tomorrow, and how it offers us unshakable hope for the day when tomorrow doesn't come. We shared the story of God's love with Julia in words and stories that night. We told her that everything Jesus said and did was and is so that she and you and I might have communion with God. 
that we might know God, that we might share in the life and the joy that God intends for us, and that we might all do it together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what bearing witness is. Now, there's a popular saying that goes, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Now, the quote is often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, but they cannot actually find any documentation that he ever said it. Now, what St. Francis actually said is very similar. He said, it's no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. So in our time with Julia, there were specific times when she asked direct questions about Jesus and the Christian faith, and we answered. But at other times, no words were spoken at all. But even in those moments, we were witnessing too, by living out our faith, by showing our love for each other and for her, by welcoming her into the community and investing time to build a relationship with her. This, too, is bearing witness. Bearing witness is pointing to the love of God, the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, and the powerful counsel of the Holy Spirit in all we say and do. So a few months after our um, trip to Scotland, Julia made the decision to become a Christ follower too. And still today, Julia remains transformed by the story, active in her church family in Australia, <laughs> continuing to bear witness to the joy she's found in Jesus Christ too. Because when our eyes, ears, hearts, and hands have been opened wide by the risen one, we open wide our mouths and our lives to bear witness. That's koinonia. May it be so. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for light and life and love and above all, the presence of the living Lord among us. By your spirit who breathes within us, strengthen our faith, use our gifts, and work in our lives to bear witness to the resurrection of Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be.